Hello everyone, welcome to another exciting episode of Day Spring Discussions. I'm your host, Sean McGahey, and this is a show where we talk about movies, TV, sci-fi, fantasy, comic books. If you geek out about it, we're going to talk about it. You can listen to Day Spring Discussions on iTunes, YouTube, Podomatic, and Patreon, and contact Day Spring Discussions on the Facebook group, Twitter account, and Day Spring Discussions at gmail.com. Well, happy Thursday, everyone, and welcome to 2019 guys it is a new year lots of good things coming in this new year as far as tv and movies in the superhero sci-fi and fantasy genre of course at the end of the year we're getting star wars episode 9 middle of the year we got avengers endgame tv wise we got game of thrones the final season coming out in april amongst many other things coming our way it's going to be a good year, guys. I can feel it. A lot of good stuff. And you can be sure that I'm going to be here the whole year reporting and commenting on it as you guys respond back to me. Now, it has been a while since I've done a show and a lot of stuff has happened since then. I'm going to get to my Bumblebee and Aquaman quick reviews here in a sec. And then, of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about Young Justice Outsiders premiering tomorrow on DC Universe. But first... I got to get to the good stuff, guys. So about two weeks ago, I put up this poll, started this challenge, so to speak, the Arrowverse Hottest Heroes Challenge, something just a little stupid to do to pass the time on this break as the shows in the holiday season are on break, among us, whatever you want to call it. And I got to say, I had some surprising results from it. I posted the polls on Facebook and Twitter. And it's been interesting, you know, kind of the uh, way it's all turned out. I took the top eight reoccurring characters of guys and girls from all four Arrowverse shows and put them in a bracket style challenge up on social media. You guys voted and the results are very interesting. But now we have our finalists for each series and we are in the semifinals. I just want to go through real quick and review that and give you my thoughts on how everything has shaken down. So first off, in the arrow bracket, we have the number one seed, Oliver Queen. No surprise there. He's my pick for the male bracket to win it all. He's going up in this one, and there's no real surprise. But number eight seed in the female bracket, Nessa Al Ghul, came up took out Felicity, the number one seed in the first round, then number two, Sarah, then number three, Thea. It's one of those sleeper hits. So she's coming out, and they are going to be facing off against the couple from Legends of Tomorrow. So number one seed, Sarah Lance, is going up against her former flame, Nessa Al Ghul. And then Oliver is going up against number eight seed, Leonard Snart. Again, another sleeper hit came up, beat some stiff competition, and is in the semifinal round. Sarah is my pick to win it all for the ladies. Oliver is my pick to win it all for the guys, but we'll see how it goes because there have been quite a few shakeups going on. Those polls are up right now on the Facebook group and Twitter account, so you can go vote on that. Really, there haven't been a lot of things that the Facebook group has determined because I get so fewer votes on the Facebook group than I do on Twitter. I've gotten hundreds of thousands of votes on the Twitter account, which is very surprising to me considering I'm lucky if I get maybe 100 listens on my shows. So kudos, guys. If I can get every one of you to listen to my podcast and subscribe, I think I'll be in business here. But nonetheless, usually the Twitter accounts have you know really determined the winner of it all. There was one instance in the flash bracket where it was Caitlin Snow versus Nora West Allen only separated by a couple of votes on Twitter. I went over to Facebook and Caitlin had a few more votes than Nora, hence putting her ahead and put her in the flash final round against Iris West. But Iris came out and beat her. Speaking of that, Team Flash, you got the number one seeds, both Iris West and Barry Allen, the power couple representing Team Flash. And they're going against the couple from Team Supergirl. Iris will be facing off against Lena Luther, the number one, number three seed in the Supergirl bracket. And then we got Brainiac 5. Now, this is very interesting. First off, 
through this poll, I have realized there are a lot of Supergirl hardcore fans because the Supergirl polls have gotten a lot more votes than the other ones. And Brainiac 5, there is a huge following for him. Now, if it's him and Oliver in the finals and he wins, I'm going to call bullshit. I'm still going to honor it, but I'm going to call bullshit because, come on now, I'm a completely, you know, heterosexual, love the ladies guy. But you're telling me Brainiac 5 is hotter than Oliver Queen? I call bullshit on that. But nonetheless, the Flash versus Supergirl polls are going to go up tomorrow. You can vote on that. Saturday, you get your break. And then Sunday starts the finals. And hopefully by Monday or Tuesday, when I do my next show, we will have the winners and find out who is the hottest guy and girl in the Arrowverse. So guys, go on the Facebook group and Twitter and vote now. All right, next up on the agenda tomorrow on DC Universe streaming service, Young Justice Outsiders, the third season of Young Justice premieres. And honestly, I cannot wait. I spent the last couple of months going through and reviewing the first season and second season. And I am super excited. This show was or is one of my top three superhero animated series next to Batman, the animated series, and X-Men, the animated series, back in the 90s. Uh, Probably following this is probably going to be the Justice League animated series, but I love this show, guys. And when it was canceled five years ago, severely disappointed, but now it's come back by popular demand, which is awesome. Young Justice Outsiders. Now, between season one and two, there was a five-year difference. I heard there was going to be another five-year difference between Invasion and Outsiders. So I actually tweeted one of the show's writers, Greg Weissman, and asked him. And someone commented back saying, no, no, it's two years. And Greg, without subtly saying, said, yeah, it's about two years. He he couldn't say it that it was, but that's kind of what he hinted at, that it's two years between Invasion and Outsiders. Either way, I'm fine with it. I'm excited to watch this. They're coming out three episodes a week. So tomorrow we get three episodes. Next week, week three episodes, going all the way to episode 13, where they take a little break. And it's interesting because you got three episodes, say they're about 20, 22 minutes a piece. You're looking at over an hour long viewing. So it's almost like you're watching an hour long show if you sit down and just watch all three of them, which is what I plan to do. I'm going to get to it probably tomorrow night course next week i'll come back and let you know what i think but i'm super excited for that to come back if you haven't checked out young justice i've told you several times on here watch it it's a great superhero show i mean as i said it's one of my favorite super animated series i think it's one of my favorite superhero series flat out so go watch the first two seasons if you haven't really quickly so you'll get ready for outsiders tomorrow and just to comment real quickly Titans had its series finale while we were on break. And Titans World of Things, I was very curious and hesitant about when it started. I wasn't a big fan of the first episode, but each episode got better and better as it went on. The Jason Todd episode in the middle of the season was phenomenal. And I gotta say, Titans is probably one of my favorite shows to watch right now, mainly because it focuses on Dick Grayson being one of my favorite dc characters or comic book characters in general and it's right in that transition period for him where he's trying to figure out what he's going to do after robin before he becomes nightwing i was hoping we get nightwing by the end of the season that's okay um hopefully we get him next season but there's a lot of stuff going on that and spoiler if you haven't watched the post credit scene that last episode they introduced crypto and superboy which i'm super excited for of course and if you're unfamiliar with that of course I refer you back to Young Justice. Okay, guys, so I'm going to go through these two films that came out while we were on break. I usually run a show of about 15 to 20 minutes. I'm about the 10-minute mark almost now, so needless to say, I think I'm going to go a little over, so just bear with me, and, you know, if you want to take a pause, come back, that's fine, but guys, I do go spoilers as if you've seen both these films. So if you haven't seen Bumblebee or Aquaman, don't listen to what I have to say because I'm going to be spoiling some stuff. So there is your warning. 
I'm going to go as, as quick as I can. I could do a lot more on both these films, but I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. So starting off, Bumblebee, directed by Travis Knight, the guy who brought us Kubo and the Two Strings. And this is the first live-action Transformers film not directed by Michael Bay. We're going back to the 80s, and this is a reboot, actually. If you watch it, I mean, there's no relation to the previous films and their continuity. Um, it's completely redoing the franchise, which I think is great. I like that first live-action Transformers film. I like the third one, Dark Side of the Moon. Or is it Dark of the Moon? Either way, those two I own, I enjoy those. The other three, complete crap. Garbage, garbage, garbage. I'm so glad they got rid of Michael Bay to redo this. Travis Knight, I love Kubo and the Two Strings. I feel like it was robbed for Best Animated Film in the year it was up in the Oscars. So that gave me faith in this film. The fact they got Haley Steinfeld, who I think is a good actress, to lead it. Another good thing. And then we have Bumblebee and a couple of Decepticons, which takes away a lot of the muck that was the other Transformers films. Keep it simple. I like that. So I was interested going into this film. Coming out of it, I will say it is my third favorite of the Transformers films. I still enjoy the first and third one better, but I do like it. I think it's a great restart for the franchise. Bumblebee, of course, is adorable. I like at the beginning, we get Cybertron. We got Optimus Prime. I will say I'm a little disappointed, though. One of my favorite Transformers, Cliff Jumper, gets the axe. That sucks. But I was thinking about it, too. If we're doing a reboot, Jazz, another one of my favorite Transformers, he died in the first Transformers film. We can get him back in this one, hopefully the way he's supposed to look. So that gets me excited. Now, did I enjoy this film or get excited as much as the first live-action Transformers film? No. Did I get excited or love this film as much as I love the 1986 Transformers film? No way, because I love that movie. And really, that's where my Transformers love stems from, is how good I think that film is. But I think it's a great reboot and a great place to go from here as far as restarting the Transformers live-action franchise. And you can bet your butt that Paramount and Hasbro definitely has no plans to give up on this franchise. Sure, this one didn't make as much as the other Transformers films, but really, they shouldn't have expected it to because what Michael Bay did was slowly kill the Transformers franchise, and Bumblebee started off on a tough road before it even premiered, but there's good praise for this film. And... If they put another one, and this the second one or the next one makes more money, that's a good thing, okay? But I think they got a really good foundation with this film to go ahead and restart the Transformers live-action franchise. Whether Travis Knight will be back for the other one, I don't know. Haley Steinfeld, I think she did a good job. Like I said, I think she's a good actress. Focusing on her, her character did very well. You got some cheesy moments in this film, of course. Like the whole thing about how she was a diver before her dad died. And then, of course, at the end of the film, her big moment is she has to dive again to save Bumblebee. A little cheesy stuff there. The 80s. I love the 80s, of course. It's where the Transformers were born. I felt like sometimes they were trying to shove too much of the 80s down in there. With the music, you play like 30 seconds of a song. And then two minutes later, you play 30 seconds of another song. We get it. You're in the 80s. You don't have to keep reminding us. The actor or character who played opposite Steinfeld, what was his name? Uh, the character's name was Mimo. Actor is Jorge Lindborg Jr. He was all right. I think, you know, he was there to support Steinfeld's character, Charlie. So he didn't get a lot to do. We didn't get into much into his life. But again, the focus was on Charlie. So I'm okay with that. John Cena as Agent Burns. I don't have any problem with John Cena, but I gotta say, he wasn't great. He, As far as what I expect John Cena to do at this point, he was not great. I was hoping to do a little more. Again, goes back to that cheese factor and what this film was. 
But like I said, Haley Steinfeld, very solid in this film, worked well with Bumblebee. The story was simple and small, which is what you need to do, going back to its roots with the Transformers. You saw Optimus Prime. You didn't see him in a little bit of an action, which was cool. Again, I enjoyed the Cybertron stuff. To me, you need to focus. Yeah, you got to have that human element there. That's fine. And I know the Transformers cost money the more they're on screen. But the Transformers each have a different personality. The Autobots and the Decepticons. They each can carry their own weight when it comes to a character's journey. And that's the way they need to go with it. Yes, you have humans. Great. I get it. But Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, Jazz, uh, Soundwave, Megatron, Starscream, God sakes, I would love to put Hot Rod in there. But we did see RC, which I was happy about. But Hot Rod being the star of the, the animated film, he's my favorite, so I'd love to see him in there. But that's a little down the road. That's fine. But like I've been saying, I enjoyed it. Did I enjoy it as much as the first live-action uh, Transformers film? No, I did not, but I think it's a really solid start to reboot this franchise that, in my opinion, has not been good for a long time. So, great job, Travis Knight, and I'm curious to see what Hasbro and Paramount does from there. Okay, guys, next up, a film that I have been looking forward to slash dreading for the last couple of years, Aquaman premiered the same day as Bumblebee. Now, this is a film in the DC EU, DC Extended Universe, DC World to DC. I don't know what they're going to call it. But Jason Moe reprises his role as Arthur Curry, a.k.a. Aquaman. We saw him briefly in Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. And then we saw him again in Justice League last year. The nice thing about this film is... People have been divided about a lot of the DC Cinematic Universe films. This one doesn't have the problem because the only connection is that A, it's got Aquaman, played by Jason Momoa, and there's a brief mention of Steppenwolf, the villain from Justice League. And that's pretty much it. Besides that, it stands on its own, which I think is great. Also, this film has a different tone than what we've seen with other DC Cinematic Universe films. Granted, the other ones were mainly directed by Zack Snyder to where he has that dark style with his lens, and I get it, but this one was directed by James Wan. Now, I'm not a huge fan of James Wan. His biggest directing credits to this point were Saw and Furious 7, both films not exactly known for their deep meaning. So, a little hesitant going into that. Jason Momoa, I loved him on Game of Thrones. I saw him in the new Conan film years ago. I didn't think he was the strongest actor. And then Amber Heard. Again, I've seen her in several things. She was the female lead Mara in this one, but I wasn't really excited about her either. So, those three things made me very hesitant about going into this film. And I'm an Aquaman fan. I grew up reading comic books, loving superheroes, and I also grew up loving the water, still do, oceans, lakes, pools, whatever. I love being near the water. I was on the swim team. I still swim to this day for exercise. So, of course, growing up, loving superheroes and swimming, obviously, one of my nicknames was Aquaman, and I've always thought he was underrated. I love that writer Jeff Johns brought him back in Blackest Night, redefined him in Brightest Day and then of course made him cool again in the new 52 and Aquaman again does have that stigma going all the way back to Super Friends in the 1970s um, where he was always a little silly to people but he rules the ocean which is 75% of the world so I never got that new 52 with Jeff John showed him that he is a force to be reckoned with he's strong he's bullet resistant and yes he can sick a motherfucking shark on your ass to eat you if he wanted to okay guy is not to be trifled with but i'd realize the perception of him so i realize why warner brothers in dc wanted to get the exact opposite of that perception with jason momoa no blonde hair clean shaven you wanted a rough big 
bearded guy to shake up the image of Aquaman. I totally understand it. Now, I've seen the film twice now. So, I usually like to see a film twice before I really share my thoughts on it. Especially if it's one that I'm really anticipating or know I'm going to have a lot of thoughts about. With Aquaman, I will say I liked it. Some people are divided on it. You know, that tone is a little off. You know, I, I get it. It's it's different from what we're used to in the DC, uh, you, DC Cinematic Universe, whatever you want to call it. I don't know, guys. But I did enjoy it. Knowing, however, kind of like with X-Men Apocalypse, I realize X-Men Apocalypse isn't the best movie. But as an X-Men film and an X-Men fan, I enjoyed it because I saw a lot of good X-Men things in it as far as psychic battles, Magneto messing with magnetic poles, things that I know in comic books have happened. So I know half my enjoyment of this Aquaman film is simply because I'm an Aquaman fan and it didn't completely suck. They did things right and the fact that Jeff Johns helped write it I think went a long way and gives me more hope for Shazam coming out in a couple of months as well. But they got his parents' origin correct. Black Manta origin they pretty much got good. They brought in the trench, which I thought was cool. And that's kind of what this film, I think, did best overall was world building. Giving us the seven kingdoms of the seas. Showing us all the different creatures and life that live in the sea. Um, did a great job with the underwater talking and you know the way that all perceived I thought that was great now I was talking with my buddy Al the other day on the phone about the film and he definitely you know had some thoughts and had a realization much like in Wonder Woman you had your star Gal Gadot who wasn't the strongest actress so what did Patty Jenkins do she surrounded her with a great supporting cast to help elevate her you know um chris pine honestly he's the whole reason that movie's good in my opinion okay he's with her most of the shots and the reason she looks good i think is because of chris pine so of course that's why you got to bring him back for the sequel right and again with this my buddy al pointed out that there's only about three or four minutes where jason momoa is actually by himself it's the part towards the end when he's trying to get the trident and he's with the creature other than that, he's completely surrounded by other people that he's playing off of. And again, it's giving him a good supporting cast to elevate his performance. And when you got people like Nicole Kidman, William Defoe, Patrick Wilson, some great actors and actresses, I think it's definitely going to make him look good. So going back to my three worries, Jason Momoa, I thought he did an okay job. Not a great job, an okay job, but... I can definitely see them going with some of Aquaman's darker stories, given the fact that he's got the beard. I don't think he's going to lose it. So let's go back to some of those 90s stories where Aquaman has a beard. He doesn't have the orange shirt on, and he's got a harpoon for a hand. I mean, I guarantee you in the next one, I think that's what they're going to do, is do the storyline where Black Manta cuts off his hand, and then he gets a harpoon hand. That would be a good storyline. Probably one of the most darker and infamous storylines of Aquaman is when his baby son, Arthur Jr., is killed. Pretty dark. I don't know if they'll do that, at least not in the second one, but I bet more on the harpoon hand than I would for the baby son dying in the next one, at least. So Momoa did okay. There was still that one line that was in the trailer that bothered me. Um, just a couple of pieces of dialogue that didn't seem right because they were just so cheesy. There's that one where um, Mera's like, Atlantis has always had a king, but now it needs something more. And he's like, what could be more than a king? And Nicole Kidman, his mother, says, a hero. I feel like if they would have taken out Momoa's part, his line in that, it would have flowed better. Or again, maybe it was the way Momoa delivered it that made it off. But a couple pieces of dialogue that you know weren't great. And that's really what the movies come out to be. You know, people... I've said this to people about Batman v Superman versus Captain America Civil War. 
there are so many things, little things, that I'm willing to forgive in a film and still give it a positive rating and still enjoy it. I acknowledge that Civil War has small things wrong with it, but it still has enough good that I still enjoy it. That may be Superman, Dawn of Justice, the theatrical cut, has so many little things that are bad with it, I'm not willing to forgive it. The ultimate cut, however, I think still might be my favorite DC Cinematic Universe movie, even with Aquaman and Wonder Woman, to be honest. But that's a story and a conversation for a different podcast. But in any event, Jason Momoa, he did okay. Amber Heard, again, not a big fan of her. I know she's like a blonde or brunette, and you make her that bright red hair, I thought looked stupid. There are so many good actresses in Hollywood that are natural redheads. Why did you have to get one that naturally you had to dye the hair fake red? I didn't get it, but luckily for most of the film, it's wet, so it doesn't look as bad when it's dry. I will give Amber Heard credit. She was good. I liked her in this film. Uh, Obviously, I liked the way she looked when she was in the (laughs) classic green costume, but she was great. Mara, for those of you who don't know, I mean, this is a woman that can go toe-to-toe with Wonder Woman. Some people think she's just Aqua Woman. She's not, you know. As you see from the movie, her powers are different. She can do different things than what Aquaman can, and she's a great counterpart to him. I thought her back and forth with Momoa, there were some really good parts to that. So I was pleasantly surprised with Amber Heard. Out of my three worries that I listed, I think she did the most solid job out of all of them. Now, as for our director, James Wan, again, not a big fan of his. Like I said, world building was probably the best thing that this film did. Now, to me, a director's job is to get the best performance out of their actors and actresses. That's their number one job. I mean, they have other jobs, but that's, to me, the most important thing. Given the fact that, again, I'm not a big fan of Amoa or Heard and their acting abilities, I think he probably did the best he could. Um, it needed a little more emotion, to be honest. Even out of, let's say, Nicole Kidman, a great actress like that, I could have used a little more emotion, especially that beginning scene when she was leaving her husband and son. You know, I mean, she should have been bawling, honestly, in my opinion. But anyway, those three things, Juan, Heard, Momoa... They did okay. If someone else was in those parts, could the film have been better? I still believe that. What's going to happen from here, given the fact that Aquaman seems to be a success, it's passing all the other DC Cinematic Universe films, we're definitely going to get a sequel. I don't know who's going to stay, who's going to go. While I enjoyed the film, I know half of my enjoyment is because of the fact that it's Aquaman and it did not completely suck. So take that with what you will, guys. And let me know what you think about it. So that's it for me today. Time for you to fire back on the social media groups and Gmail account. Bumblebee and Aquaman, guys. Did you see it? Did you like it? What did you like? What didn't you like? Do you think I'm off on some things? Do you agree with me on some things? Let me know. Young Justice Outsiders, I don't care what you think. Watch season one and season two if you haven't. Then get ready for Outsiders tomorrow and then let me know. And then finally, of course, go vote. Arrowverse, Hottest Heroes Challenge. We're in the home stretch, guys. This is it. Who's going to be the hottest guy and girl in the Arrowverse? You will decide. Go vote on Twitter and Facebook. You can find me personally on Twitter and Instagram, Slim, that's with a Y, Slim Dayspring 12. And I'm going to be back next week, guys. Uh, I will share my thoughts on Young Justice Outsiders. We will have the final results of the Hottest Heroes Challenge in the Arrowverse and hopefully more news to come. That's it. Until next time, may the force be with us all.